from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. This is Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Hello and welcome to Free Expression from the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal. With me, Jerry Baker, editor at large of the journal. If you're not already subscribing to Free Expression, please do sign up at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever wherever you may do your listening. This week, a look back and a look forward at global conflicts and the challenges that they pose to America. In 2023, we added Israel Hamas to Ukraine Russia, the growing list of important wars in which American allies find themselves fighting brutal enemies. How will these conflicts unfold in 2024? Can Israel really achieve its goal of destroying Hamas without inflaming Arab and world opinion against it? Can Ukraine continue to resist Russia's assault as we approach the two-year anniversary of Vladimir Putin's invasion. And how is the U.S. handling both conflicts? Is it time for a rethink in Ukraine as that conflict seems to have entered a stalemate? What's the right approach to the Middle East? Does the Biden administration's policy of support for Israel, while urging restraint by Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition government, make any strategic or tactical sense? And where does all this leave America's larger security interests? How crucial are these fights to our ability to achieve our strategic goals? Well, with me, I'm pleased to say, is General David Petraeus. You'll know him very well, of course. The general served with distinction in the U.S. military, commanding U.S. and NATO forces in Iraq and Afghanistan. And he also served as director of the CIA under President Barack Obama. He's published multiple works on military strategy and history. His latest, he co-authored with Andrew Roberts. It's a book called Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. And General David Petraeus joins me now. General, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Good to be with you, Jerry. Thank you. A lot to talk about at the end of this turbulent year for global security. Let's start with the immediate and most pressing, I think, issue for the world and for U.S. security, or the one at least that's come up most recently, which is the war between Israel and Hamas. I remember asking you a couple of months ago when your book was published, and we'll talk a little bit about your book later in the uh, podcast, but how feasible it was for Israel to achieve its goals of destroying Hamas and what challenges it would face. And we're two months into that war now. How do you see the progress of that war by Israel? And how much has Israel been able to achieve its goals? And how much more is it going to have to do? And is it going to be able to do? Well, as you may recall, when we talked some months back, I noted that the context, the battlefield, the situation here is the most fiendishly difficult, I think, in anyone's memory when it comes to urban operations. This is an enemy who doesn't wear a uniform, fights using civilians as human shields, holds hundreds at that time of hostages, has hundreds of miles of tunnels, knows the neighborhood really, really well, is going to begin blowing themselves up at some point in time. In other words, use suicide vest and suicide car bombers. And again, all of this in a very densely populated area that doesn't just have small houses, but in some cases has real high rises that have to be cleared completely. And I think that that has borne out that this has been a very tough fight, a very difficult campaign. Israel has made considerable progress in the northern part of Gaza Strip, but the central and and southern part still is largely out of their control. There are operations ongoing in each of those locations. But it's assessed that the leaders of Hamas have gravitated to Khan Yunus, the large city in the south, and that this will require another entire campaign similar to that required to take Gaza City in the north. So again, there's a lot of hard work still to be done, a lot of tough fighting still to be done. I think there has to be enormous care about civilian casualties. The use of very large munitions and so forth may have been necessary in certain cases because of the underground bunkers and headquarters and so on, all built around this network of tunnels that makes this fiendishly difficult. The problem, I think, is that while the two big ideas that we discussed, again, when we talked about this before, are are still, I think, valid, the need to destroy Hamas and also to dismantle the Hamas political wing, there clearly are several additional big ideas that are needed that are still not yet resolved. They're very, very difficult. That's why. And the Israeli government and others are all trying to figure out solutions to them. But one, of course, is who will oversee Gaza once Hamas is destroyed and once the political wing has been dismantled? What kind of transitional authority? Everyone agrees it would be ideal to have a competent, capable, trustworthy Palestinian entity doing that other than Hamas. But that doesn't appear to be 
possible. And there certainly are no hands going up in the region or around the world saying that they want to take on this task. The problem is that if you don't do that, I don't know how you answer another one of the questions that is begging an answer, which is how do you keep Hamas from reconstituting even after it has been destroyed, noting that we have experience with this when the U.S. pulled its final combat forces out of Iraq and the Iraqi security forces took their eye off the Islamic State. A couple of years later, you had the first ever Islamist extremist caliphate. And we had to go back in, help the Iraqi and then Syrian democratic forces deal with that. So that's another issue. And then, frankly, the whole question about the life for the Palestinians in Gaza after Hamas is destroyed uh, and after, frankly, much of the infrastructure has been seriously damaged or destroyed as well. So they've got to come up with answers to all of this. And that actually influences the kind of campaign that they conduct. Because if indeed it is a campaign where you clear and hold areas and then rebuild them, that's one approach. And then you could get the civilians back into their houses. You'd have to control access and egress, as opposed to just pushing them all over the Strip and going after Hamas and destroying their infrastructure and so forth. I think it's premature to start talking about moving on to another phase the way we've heard various observers describe. And the idea that you could finish this off with just precision counter-terrorist force operations doesn't square with our experience during the surge in Iraq either. Keep in mind that we banged away with our special mission units in cities like Ramadi and Fallujah and a number of others for a number of years, taking out high-value targets every single night, but the situation getting worse because we didn't go in and clear and hold these areas and then rebuild and then restore basic services and so forth, and then actual trustworthy security forces and local institutions. So that's where this is right now. And as I noted, a, a number of questions that beg answers that are very, very difficult and a lot of tough fighting that I think still needs to be done. Israel is facing tremendous international pressure, and it seems that at least kind of behind the scenes diplomatically, pressure from the U.S. too over the scale of civilian casualties there. Estimates, obviously, we, we can't be sure about the estimates. The Gaza, the Hamas authorities in Gaza claim up to 20,000 civilians have died. But even if that number is an exaggeration, it does seem a very significant number have probably died. Again, for your direct experience of fighting in some extent in these circumstances, do you think from what you've seen that Israel is doing all it can to limit civilian casualties? Or do you think actually that it could be more surgical, it could be more precise and result in less of the kind of terrible civilian losses that we've seen? Well, first of all, Jerry, in this kind of operation, civilian casualties and damage and destruction to civilian infrastructure are inevitable. Key is, of course, to keep them to an absolute minimum, noting that in some cases that means that your own forces may be more exposed as a result. We used to have a sign on the wall of the operations centers of the headquarters I was privileged to lead that asked, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? If the answer to that is no, you're supposed to go back and retool the operation to ensure that you'd get to yes. Again, it's difficult to sit where I am or sit where you are and in a sense, second guess this or examine this, but the numbers are high. They are very concerning. The damage is very considerable. And again, perhaps if they go at this thinking that they'll end up owning this, which I, I fear may be the default. Again, no one else is stepping forward to take over in the wake of this. And it may be that Israel has to do it anyway, just to ensure that Hamas cannot reconstitute itself. I'm at a loss as to how they would prevent that if they pull out at the end of all of this and allow some other third force or transitional entity to do that, given that I don't see any really competent, capable forces out there that might be willing to take on this mission. So again, I think they have already, to be fair, I think, made uh, adjustments. The reports of civilian losses, noting that, yes, they're coming from a Hamas entity, but they have actually been reduced quite considerably in recent weeks. And I think they've got to redouble their efforts in that regard. Uh, and they need to do that, one, just for the Palestinians themselves, obviously, but also there is a strategic component to this. I think it was now Secretary of Defense, Austin General Austin, of course, who was my 
three-star operational commander, the second of them during the surge, the second half of the surge, he knows well what it is, how we sought to carry out the operations that we did to minimize civilian casualties and infrastructure damage, noting that we were going to end up owning these areas for a considerable period of time until we could establish host nation security forces and institutions to which we could gradually transition the responsibilities that we were shouldering until that time. It's he is the one who has said that they need to be careful not to achieve a tactical victory that could end up being a strategic failure or setback. How do you see the wider Middle East theater as it stands right now? We haven't seen the kind of multi-front escalation in the war that a lot of people did fear. Hezbollah from Lebanon in the north, perhaps in some way Iran getting dragged in since it is Iran that's behind, as we know, both Hamas and Hezbollah. But yeah, we have seen these you know, quite consistent attacks on U.S. forces in the region, on Syria, in the Red Sea. We've now seen this, what seems like, it does seem a significant escalation of attacks by, again, these Iranian-backed Yemeni Houthi forces, essentially shutting down a lot of the shipping lanes in the Red Sea. So while we haven't yet got into a broader Middle Eastern conflict, it does seem like the risks are there. How do you read that? Well, the risks are definitely there. And if we just sort of walk our way around this clockwise, Hezbollah in the north is a very significant potential risk, but seems to have been limiting its actions to an area just a bit beyond the border, not that far. Uh, and if fairly modest number of attacks per day compared with what it could do, keeping in mind that it has reportedly 150,000 rockets and missiles, some of which are very long range with very large warheads and quite accurate. So if they chose to, I think they could actually overwhelm the Israeli integrated air and ballistic missile defense system. It can only handle so many at one time, but they know that if they do that, they're going to get hammered in return even worse than they did in 2006. And we should note that the initial assessments after the 2006 war with Hezbollah did not realize how significant the damage and destruction was to Hezbollah infrastructure. It was only years later that we did reassessments. In fact, I was the commander of Central Command at that time, having already commanded the surge in Iraq. And then we did another reassessment sometime around the time that I was the director of the CIA. Again, so they know that if they really launch a large number of missiles and drones and rockets, that they'll be in the receiving a very substantial response from the Israeli Defense Forces. And I think, I hope, touch wood, that that is deterring them from doing more than they're doing right now, which they probably feel they need to just to show a little bit of sympathy for Hamas. Then, of course, let's not forget the West Bank. There are attacks and demonstrations and other concerning developments there. The Israeli Defense Forces seem to have that in reasonable hand, but that obviously has to be a concern. The Iranian-supported Shia militia in Iraq have actually been carrying out uh, rocket and drone attacks on U.S. bases in Iraq and also in Syria. The U.S. has been responding to those. Again, it seems to be a somewhat measured number. There was an attack, in fact, even on the U.S. embassy in the Green Zone the governance zone of Baghdad as well. The Iraqis say that they have made some arrests in that particular case. Again, we'll see whether those resume. But again, none of these have quite gotten out of hand. And then you look at the case that you described, which is the the Houthis, the Iranian-supported Yemeni Shia forces that have been attacking shipping in the Red Sea. That is becoming significant because now you see shipping companies, the major shipping companies, saying that they're not going to go through that, which means that they don't go through the Suez Canal, which means that they either have a very long diversion uh, all the way around Africa or they have to transship it some other way. That can actually have an impact on the global economy in a way that really nothing else has remarkably so far in this particular war, at least since the oil markets recognized that Iran was not going to interdict the shipping out of the Gulf. So you'd have freedom of navigation for the gas and oil that comes out of the Gulf and fuels much of the global economy. And also that the U.S. was not going to reimpose sanctions on Iran that would take its 1.5 million barrels per day-ish off the market. So, But the Red Sea attacks are significant. I think ultimately we're going to have to take more robust action in response to that perhaps even in some cases beginning to preempt these strikes by uh, having much better intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets over top of the areas from which 
these uh, drone and uh, missile attacks have been taking place. Obviously, there are significant U.S. assets in the region. Could that mean the engagement by U.S. naval forces or other forces to stop these attacks from the Houthis? Uh, It could. And there are also uh, allied ships there as well. So again, there's a fleet of ships. In fact, a British ship has actually interdicted some of these operations. Uh, You know, this is a little bit of a carry on. Remember that we used to do a counter piracy mission that was more off the coast of Somalia, but also off of southern Yemen to a degree. So this is around the corner from that, if you will, and and around the Balba Mandab, that choke point there. So U.S. Central Command, which I was privileged to command over a decade ago, has a coalition that can deal with this. And I'm sure that that's the base piece for what is now going on. How do you rate the way the Biden administration is handling this? I mean, they have been very publicly supportive of Israel, as I say, while urging restraint. They've um, not just rhetorically, but of course, sending ships to the Mediterranean to kind of deter Hezbollah in particular from attacking in the north. But then we have seen a lot of these, as you described, a lot of these attacks on US military bases, on other military assets in the region by Iranian-backed forces. And the administration does seem very, very keen to downplay the significance of the Iranian role in supporting whether it's Hezbollah, Hamas, or the Houthis, or these others there. The administration doing enough to deter these adversaries from carrying out these kind of attacks? Well, you only know when it is that deterrence doesn't work. Certainly these attacks have been numerous. It's probably over 100 on various, again, U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria, but none that I'm aware of that have killed any of our soldiers or seriously wounded them. And again, I don't know that it's in our interest to ratchet this up. So what they're all trying to do is to find the right level of response. There has been response, and they've actually killed a number of Iranian supported militias members, both in Iraq, and in one case actually preempted what was a planned action that they could see very clearly and was therefore a clear case of self-defense. And then in another case, uh, a base that's just across the Syrian border from Iraq. So again, I think they've been generally measured in what it is that they're doing. I'm sure there's a host of contingency plans for other actions that could ratchet that pressure up, including undoubtedly you have to have contingency plans for it directly against Iran. But I don't think it's in Iran's interest to get into it directly with the U.S., and I'm not sure that it's in our interest to do that either. Iran does have lots of capabilities. They could cause a lot of trouble, including in the Gulf, the freedom of navigation of which is really quite critical to the global economy. So again, I I think everyone is, is trying to respond appropriately and not do more than is necessary in that regard, probably out of concern that it could spark something more substantial. Because the threats are real. The Iranian-supported Shia militia in Iraq in particular have very, very large numbers and could carry out a lot of mischief in Iraq. The Iraqi Counterterrorism Service absolutely will ensure that our embassy is not breached and so forth. But that just could be a mess. And again, I think there's incentive to avoiding provocation, even as they do respond appropriately. I think the Red Sea, on the other hand, they're likely going to have to take more robust action there. The Houthis have been ratcheting that up. I think there have to be limits to what it is that they do. And I think they've probably crossed those limits at this point in time. When you can't use the Suez Canal, one of the major arteries of the world, uh, that's a real concern. We're going to take a quick break there. When we come back, we'll have more with General David Petraeus looking at the state of the conflicts that are going on around the world and how they're likely to unfold in 2024. Stay with us. You're listening to Free Expression with Jerry Baker. Don't forget, you can listen to the latest episode anytime on your smart speaker. Just say, play the Opinion Free Expression podcast. Now, back to Jerry Baker. I'm back with General David Petraeus. We're talking about the state of global security as we enter 2024, and in particular, what it all means for the United States. Let's move on to the longer standing conflict, which obviously rages on in Europe, and it's Russia and Ukraine. We've talked a lot about this over the last year and a half. 2023 began, I think, with relatively high hopes for those supporters of Ukraine, uh, the United States, yourself. You've been a very ardent supporter of Ukraine, as have I, and others. Ukraine had successfully repelled the initial Russian assault, started to recapture some territory. We were looking forward to this big spring offensive that they were going to launch, but they were going to really try and seize back significant amounts of the territory that Russia had taken. That does seem to have kind of stalled out. Out, and the war does seem to be at best, I think it's probably fair to say right now, stalemated. But of course, a lot of uncertainty now about the continuation of U.S. and uh, certainly U.S. military and economic and financial support to Ukraine. Where do you see that conflict now? Are we 
looking at a prolonged stalemate, a kind of frozen conflict? Do you think there's any chance of a breakthrough from either side? How do you see it? Well, in fact, the commander of Ukrainian forces, General Zeluzhny, described it as a stalemate in an interview with The Economist and also laid out the capabilities that Ukraine needs to break that stalemate. And it's not clear that they're going to get certainly all of those. You're right, though, Jerry, to note that the counteroffensive did not achieve what certainly the Ukrainians, many of us, uh, hoped that they would. And as we look at it, it shouldn't be a surprise, given the enormous minefields that they encountered, much greater than doctrinal distances for Russia, not fully appreciated, even with all the satellite imagery that reportedly was available before the offensive. But we didn't get our M1 tanks there to them on time. The delay in our decision also meant that the German Leopard tanks weren't all on hand. We didn't provide them enough of the armored breaching capabilities they need. And above all, our own doctrine says that to breach those kinds of very substantial defensive positions, belts of defense, with the tank ditches, wire obstacles, trenches for soldiers, very substantial artillery, drones over top of all of this for the Russians to call in artillery very accurately as they, the Ukrainian forces try to breach and so forth, that this was an exceedingly difficult task. The Ukrainians did make modest gains in the south in the Zaporizhia area, but didn't get anywhere near close enough to the key line of communication along the southeastern coast to interdict that with the indirect fire systems that they have. That's a disappointment without question. I should note that the mood in Kyiv when I was there about seven weeks ago was much more sober than it was when I was there three and a half months or so ago, understandably. And again, the recognition is that there is a stalemate. So they're going to have to go on the defense for a period of time, see how much more force they can generate, wait for the additional assistance from the U.S., which I do think will be forthcoming, Jerry. I think that there is a bipartisan majority in both houses of Congress, very strong bipartisan support in the Senate, but they're all using this to maneuver to get some concessions from the administration on border security and border policy. I think that'll get worked out in January and we'll get a very substantial amount to provide to Ukraine. But there is uncertainty there without question. And uncertainty plays into the hands of Vladimir Putin and undermines the confidence of the Ukrainians at a time when Putin still thinks that the Russians can outsuffer the Ukrainians, the Europeans, and the North Americans. We need to continue to do everything we can to prove him wrong. But it is the Russians who are on the offensive now very, very costly, huge losses, but they seem to be willing to take those. And they're making modest gains, but those gains do continue. So a very tough fight. And you asked, you know, does this look like it's going to drag out for some time? I fear that that's the case. We'll see whether or not some of the other initiatives can help Ukraine in various ways and whether or not their own indigenous industries can help them as they are. Uh, we should give them credit, for example, using maritime drones and also long-range anti-ship missiles. They've actually they've driven the Russians out of their most important Black Sea fleet base, which is in the Crimean port of Sevastopol, and pushed them all the way further to the east of the Black Sea. That has enabled the Ukrainians to export grain products and to also push the Russian ships, many of them out of range with the missiles that they have on board, which they were using to attack the port of Odessa in southwestern Ukraine and, and other locations. But a tough fight. And again, their own commander acknowledged a stalemate and enumerated what they need to break that stalemate, but not clear that they're going to get all of those different capabilities. I realize this is obviously a matter for the Ukrainians, and everybody always says that it's their war, and we're assisting them in their war, and they determine the objectives. But what point do you think a negotiation has to be broached? As you said, a stalemate means literally that neither side really advances any significant amount. It's going to result, in obviously, in significantly more military casualties. But given particularly, you know, Russia's ability to keep hitting targets deep in Ukraine, a lot more civilian casualties. At what point do we have to kind of say, you know what, we are not going to achieve more, especially given the lack of resources that the Ukrainians will have in the next year or so? And what point do we think we should be urging them, or at least supporting them. Clearly, Zelensky doesn't want to do this right now, but uh, there's some kind of a negotiated settlement here that stops the bloodshed, 
recognizes the kind of de facto lines that have been achieved so far and at least brings an end to the immediate conflict. Well, it's a very tough call because that implies that Russia is willing to negotiate and there's no signs of that whatsoever. Periodically, Russians will say they'd like to negotiate really just to cause a bit more challenges for Ukraine with the West and so on to undermine their case. And then again, what would the reasons for Ukraine to negotiate be, especially if they're able to stop the Russians? Um, Would this just be another frozen conflict? And we saw that the last frozen conflict didn't prevent Russia from carrying out a very brutal and unprovoked invasion, a further invasion of Ukraine. There's no indicator that Vladimir Putin is satisfied with what it is that they've taken in this particular invasion, noted that they didn't achieve their main objective, which was to take Kiev, topple the government, and replace President Zelensky with a pro-Russian figure. So on the Ukrainian side, there would have to be enormous assurances, something like NATO membership, EU membership, a real pledge of continued support, perhaps NATO forces on their soil. Otherwise, again, I'm not sure why Ukraine would be willing to negotiate with someone who is completely untrustworthy, is the opposite of integrity, and still has a grievance-filled, revanchist, revisionist view of history that denies Ukraine its right to exist. And they've all reiterated this just in recent weeks, and also indicated that the goals still lie far beyond the areas that they have taken now, noting that they control about 18% of Ukrainian territory at this point. Again, you can construct some kind of scenario in which Western promises of, again, a marshal like reconstruction plan, NATO membership, EU membership, and a variety of other inducements might lead Ukraine to be willing to enter negotiations. But I'm not sure what the basis, what the end game of those negotiations would be if Putin is willing to negotiate. But you can see, again, I'm sure that there's a lot of deep thinking going on about this in various NATO capitals. But I don't think that Ukraine is really ready to consider that just yet either. Just briefly, General, do you think that part of Putin's calculation is what happens here in the United States next year? And in particular, if Donald Trump gets elected, he thinks he probably has a better chance of achieving his goals. Do you think that's right? He certainly thinks that probably. So yeah, sure. Again, it creates an incentive for Putin to delay and delay and delay. Also see, does Congress actually come through? Again, I think that Congress will. I think Congress recognizes that if Putin isn't stopped here, he continues on. We should note as well, again, this is about actually our national security, as you know, Jerry. I mean, I know that you agree with this, but a number of Americans aren't quite as convinced that this is not charity. This is our national security and the security of NATO, which we lead. And the Europeans have stepped up. They have now contributed or pledged more in security assistance than we have pledged a a bit more. And we have provided a substantial amount, to be sure. $44 billion is very significant. But if you look at that over a two-year period and recall that our defense budget alone during that period in time would be somewhere around $1.7 trillion, it doesn't appear as substantial as again, the gains that we're getting from this in terms of the destruction of 60% of the Russian tank fleet, that's actually a pretty good return on investment on what Europe and the United States have provided to Ukraine. But finally, uh, General, I want to ask you just quickly about your book that you co-wrote with Sir Andrew Roberts called Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. It is, and I must say, I'm sure people thinking about last minute Christmas gifts. It is a terrific read. And the subtitle says a very comprehensive kind of gallop through all of the conflicts from the end of the Second World War right up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the immediate phases of that war. And it's called The Evolution of warfare. Just tell us, if you would, the main lessons that you have drawn from that study, from that history about the evolution of warfare, the main lessons, especially those of us, we hope, on the right side of conflicts, and how you can win these conflicts. Because we've had so many, sorry to say, but so many wars in the last 20 years, which don't seem to result in a clean victory, should we say. We like to think of clean victories in the way that maybe the first Gulf War that we were involved in did, or, you know, some smaller conflicts that the U.S. has been involved in. Given the background of the last 20 years or so, what are the key lessons, particularly for the U.S. and for its allies, in terms of winning modern warfare? Well, I think there are at least three. One is the critical component of strategic leadership. The second is just recognizing that what happens in one part of the world reverberates in other parts, especially when it comes to strengthening or undermining deterrence. And then the third is the importance of ever-evolving technology. We're seeing all of that in Ukraine, by the way. 
the strategic leadership of President Zelensky, noting the war is still very much ongoing and incomplete. But his strategic leadership has been very impressive. There are four tasks a strategic leader performs, get the big ideas right, craft the right strategy, communicate the big ideas effectively, oversee their implementation, and determine how you need to refine them and do it again and again and again. Remember, the first big idea of President Zelensky is, I don't want to ride, I want ammunition. I'm going to stay in Kiev. My family's going to stay in Kiev. We're going to fight to defend Kiev to the death. And then his communication skills to his own people, to the world, to our Congress, the House of Commons, the Bundestag, all of this brilliant. You know, he's been called Churchill with an iPhone. And then overseeing the implementation, his example has been exemplary. He's provided energy and inspiration. I mean, even takes off a suit and puts on an OD uniform of various types uh, and has been wearing that ever since. Uh, And then they've refined the big ideas and have done it again and again and again. In contrast with Putin, who underestimated the Ukrainians, overestimated his own forces, failed to realize how significant the U.S. and Western response would be, et cetera, et cetera. So strategic leadership is absolutely crucial. And we recount numerous occasions where we didn't get the big ideas right early enough. It took us until 1968 in Vietnam to actually craft the appropriate strategy for that war. Having tried to win a war of attrition with search and destroy missions and a flawed metric, the enemy body count. And then in Iraq and Afghanistan, in each case, brilliant initial campaigns then stumbled a bit, took our eye off the ball in Afghanistan, didn't return to that for a number of years. Iraq, inadequate post-conflict planning and big ideas, got it sorted out, then had problems again, then did the surge, and did finally really resolve that quite well and continued that way for three and a half years until we removed our final combat forces and the Iraqi prime minister undid a fair amount of that, and they took their eyes off the Islamic State. So again, strategic leadership is absolutely crucial. And then keeping in mind that what you do in one part of the world can undermine or strengthen what it is you're trying to achieve in another part of the world. I think, for example, that the decision to withdraw from Afghanistan and the way it was conducted, which was seized on by President Xi, who said, see, can't count on the Americans, an undependable ally and partner, and look how it went. They're a great power in decline. I actually think that was probably seen by Vladimir Putin as one of the factors that led him to think that we would not respond as robustly as we have to his invasion of Ukraine. The red line that was not a red line in Syria, that reverberated out in the Indo-Pacific. So this is actually a very important issue that we have to ask ourselves. And by the way, if we're not willing to support Ukraine in its hour of need, even though our own soldiers are not fighting and dying, it's all about supporting the Ukrainians who are fighting and dying in their war of independence, their war of survival. If we don't do that, what does that do to deterrence when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, the most important theater that is out there? And finally, technology really can change the dynamics of battlefields. We've seen the impact of drones. We see a lot of this actually on the battlefield in Ukraine. It's not the future of warfare, but it shows hints of future of warfare, even as it actually has characteristics all the way back to World War I and and the Cold War when it comes to the armored systems that we're seeing. The idea that this is the war in which all quiet on the Western Front meets Blade Runner, as Max Boot has wonderfully put it, is very apt. But we see the impact of unmanned systems, not just in the air, but also increasingly on the sea, in the Black Sea, and starting to see some unmanned systems on ground. And that does give a hint as to what the future is. Drones and the other systems that we were able to deploy in increasing numbers in Iraq and Afghanistan ultimately transformed how we were able to carry out irregular warfare. And we could do so by advising, assisting, and enabling host nation partners, the Iraqi security forces, for example, in the destruction of the Islamic State, without our soldiers having to be on the front lines. So that part of the evolution of warfare is very important, but it's not determinative, especially if you don't get the big ideas right, if you don't get the strategy right, which brings us back to the critical element that is strategic leadership. Got you. I'd love to talk more and hear more of that, but the book is excellent. As I, say, I can thoroughly recommend it for those of you looking for a last-minute Christmas present. It's Conflict, 
by David Petraeus and Andrew Roberts. Uh, General David Petraeus, thanks very much for joining Free Expression. Great to be with you, Jerry. Thank you. That's it for this week. I'll be taking a short break over Christmas and New Year, but we will have a special episode of Free Expression for you next week. In the meantime, have a wonderful Christmas, a very happy New Year, and I look forward to seeing you and hearing from you and talking to you in 2024. Thanks again. Bye-bye.